Welcome to an advanced clinical care tutorial. This series of tutorials will cover aspects of caring for patients with complicated HIV and TB disease in Department of Health facilities in South Africa, compiled by the NICD and the National Department of Health and facilitated by Dr. Madeleine Muller, Clinical Advisor for Beyond Zero. This is module five on the prevention, diagnosis and management of cryptococcal meningitis. This module will cover key aspects on the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. We will continue our case of Mr. Zizi, who we have diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis. Mr. Zizi had an opening pressure of 30 centimeters water, and you've performed a therapeutic tap. But the core mainstay of treatment are antifungals. Which ones are the best? And for how long will we be treating our patient? We have standardized treatment regimens for cryptococcal meningitis in South Africa with three phases of treatment, induction, consolidation, and maintenance. These regimens are currently standard practice in most facilities. Let us look briefly at each phase. First, there's a two weeks of induction using amphotericin B, one milligrams per kilogram per day intravenously, plus fluconazole, 800 milligrams a day per os. This is followed by a consolidation phase of eight weeks with fluconazole 400 milligrams a day. And finally, a maintenance dose of fluconazole 200 milligrams a day. You will continue the fluconazole for a minimum of at least one year, but can discontinue it when the patient has had two CD4 counts of more than 200 taken at least six months apart. But what is the evidence for combining amphotericin B and fluconazole? Fluconazole is actually a relatively recent addition to the induction phase. Although flucytosine has been shown to be the best agent to use in combination with Amphob, it is currently available in South Africa only through a Section 21 application. Combination induction phase treatment has been recommended by the WHO, and South Africa have added in fluconazole after evidence from recent studies suggest that the addition of fluconazole may be beneficial. This is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 that compared the three options, amphob and flucytosine, amphob and fluconazole, and lastly amphotericin B alone. It found a significant improvement in mortality if adding flucytosine and some additional benefit with fluconazole over using amphob on its own. The study showed that there is a superior rate of clearance combining amphob and fluconazole rather than using Amphob alone. Fluconazole does not clear crypto as quickly as Amphob, with Amphob great at reducing the initial fungal load. But Amphotericin B is toxic. The most dangerous complication is renal impairment due to renal tubular toxicity, or a much more common problem can be a thrombophlebitis. There are many complications of amphob and tends to occur in the second week of treatment. The following is the routine schedule for monitoring patients on amphob. A baseline HB, creatinine, potassium and magnesium. And HB is monitored weekly and the electrolytes twice weekly. It's also important to do a fluid input and output chart on every patient, but this does not always happen. This is an important way to identify renal problems early. So how should amphotericin B be administered? This is a very useful checklist for nurses and needs to be up on the wall of every patient receiving amphob. Make sure there's a scale in the ward to be able to check the weight regularly. This 10-point checklist includes a dosing check, monitoring blood check, checking the IV line and looking for signs of herbitis, as well as checking if other medicines are being administered. Item 6 is a reminder on preloading, item 7, 8 and 9 on the administration of Amphob, and 10 on completion. Just note that there is no need to cover the bag. Although the powder is light sensitive, it loses that quality once it's mixed into the fluid. So we have started our induction treatment, but how can a patient's response to antifungal treatment be monitored? The best way to monitor the patient is clinically. 
Although one can man measure cryptococcal antigen titers, and some research is being done on that, it tends to be unpredictable and can be going up even if the patient is improving. Although the IDSA guideline recommends an LP at day 14 to document CSF culture conversion, this is neither practical nor advisable. The LP may not be sterile by day 14, and that's okay. There might still be a few fungi that will take a while to clear and will be mopped up by the fluconazole. Resistance to our induction phase treatment is rare, and so a routine switch to consolidation phase treatment at day 14 is recommended. No repeat LP is necessary unless there are signs of raised intracranial pressure or multiple relapses. In summary, cryptococcal meningitis is treated with standardized regimens but need close monitoring for possible complications and side effects. It is essential to counsel the patients thoroughly on the length and possible complications of treatment. In the next module, we will look particularly at the side effects and the management of the complications on amphotericin B. Thank you.